Thanks, Samir, and good evening, everyone. My name is Serena Chowdhury. It's my pleasure to have you here for the panel titled EU 2.0, Seeking Leadership in a New World Order. So where does Europe stand today, not just in the context of the EU, but also on the global platform? We've witnessed a rising in uh, populism. We've witnessed terror attacks, uh, the unprecedented migrant crisis, as well as some backlash against <coughs> globalization. The world is changing rapidly, and as per, of course, the theme for this year's Ricina Dialogue, uh, we're looking at disruptions that are transforming the current landscape. The EU appears to be grappling with the fundamental issue of its identity, that as it tries to navigate both political and economic upheavals. So the question is, is the EU weakening or strengthening? And what is its role in today's changing world order? So we have a very esteemed panel with us who I would like to introduce. I'm going to start off to my far right. First up, we have Charles Powell. He's the director for the El Cano Royal Institute, uh, followed by Geoffrey van Orden. He is the member of the European Parliament for the East of England. Uh, next to him, of course, we have Marek Mar Magierowski. He's the deputy minister of foreign affairs for Poland. And next to him, Carl Bildt, who, as you know, is a former prime minister of Sweden. But today I'm going to be introducing him as the co-chair of the European Council on Foreign Relations. And we also have Fyodor Lukyanov. He is the editor-in-chief of Russia in Global Affairs, uh, followed by, of course, Pedro Serrano. He's the deputy secretary general for the European External Action Service. So for today, we're going to start with some brief remarks from all of our panelists, and we'll then have a discussion, and I'd like to also open it up to the floor for your questions. So to start off, please, uh, Charles, would you like to start? Thank you very much. Uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Um, let me first of all thank the organizers for having invited me to speak at this very prestigious uh, event. Um, I would like to be very upbeat about the future of the EU because I strongly believe um, that the EU has, above all, succeeded in overcoming many of the challenges that it's faced in the last few years. So my um, first message would be the EU is alive and well and living in Brussels and our 27 member states, 28 if we include London, of course. Um, it's understandable that in, a, in an international conference such as this, we should concentrate on the bear in the room and the panda in the room and the jihadist terrorist threat and uh, the challenges posed by migration and so on. Um, but to be honest with you, my main concerns about the EU future, the EU's future, are essentially internal. Um, now, there is a possible bridge between the, the internal challenges and the external phenomena that I've just mentioned, and that basically has to do with what Danny Roderick has uh, been describing the, over the last few years as his famous trilemma. How do we reconcile the three phenomena that basically dominate our societies in this new world, namely economic globalization, political democracy, and national sovereignty? How, how can we enjoy these three things uh, simultaneously, or are we condemned to choosing uh, only two of them and abandoning the other by the wayside? <coughs> and I would basically argue that the European Union remains the best possible answer to Danny Roderick's trilemma. The European Union remains the best possible instrument or sets of instruments and policies that we Europeans have been able to design over the years in order to uh, answer this challenge. Now, admittedly, um, and therefore I would argue that basically the European Union's future in the 21st century will essentially depend on its ability to, on the one hand, <coughs> maximize the potential benefits of globalization and at the same time minimize the uh, possible uh, unwanted negative consequences of globalization. I basically see this as the EU's major threat, or major challenge, rather, sorry, in the 21st century. Now, as has been mentioned by uh, in, in the two previous remarks, um, what we have seen in the last few years in Europe is that when citizens observe that our national authorities, that our national governments are basically impotent in coming to terms with global threats, they turn their backs both on globalization per se, but also, and perhaps even more worryingly, on representative democracy. 
And this is, I think, one of the things that we have been observing in the last couple of years. Um, and very often, this frustration has been aimed at the European Union. And in my view, this is essentially unfair. And it's unfair for two reasons. First of all, because national governments are extremely good at playing the blame game. National governments nationalize success and Europeanize failure. Uh, we saw a very good example of this uh, with one of Theresa May's tweets this week, by the way, in which she took credit for policies designed and implemented by the European Union um, trying to deal in an attempt to deal with credit card uh, fraud and misuse. At the same time, and this is also deeply ironic and a little bit hypocritical perhaps, very often um, the European Union is criticized for not doing enough precisely by those who have prevented the European Union from acquiring the competences that it would need in order to be effective in certain policy areas. This is also a very uh, common sort of a critique that we've seen over the years. Now, um, whatever the reasons, what we are seeing in Europe is essentially, I think, a growing cleavage between nativists and, and cosmopolitans. Um, this has been brilliantly exploited by our populists, whether of the left or of the right. And of, of course, we all know that populists are very good at providing uh, simple answers to complex problems. And the main problem with populists, of course, is that they are popular. Um, and one thing that I would strongly encourage you to do is not to demonize our voters who have been seduced by populist political options, because ultimately, surely, our goal should be to bring them back into the fold. By the way, this has also led in some countries to uh, very dramatic uh, generational cleavages. So what, what should our priorities be then? First of all, I think the EU needs to demonstrate that it's part of the solution and not part of the problem. There is no doubt in my mind that that is the case, but specifically, it has to live up to its 21st century uh, potential. And specifically, I think we can um, refer to four or five goals. First of all, the EU needs to secure the viability, the long-term viability and stability of the euro. Um, if not, everything else will be in jeopardy. And by the way, after Brexit, the Eurozone will represent 85% uh, of the Euro European economy, considerably more than it does now. Secondly, the EU has to be more proactive in achieving sustainable, inclusive growth and job creation. And most specifically, it has to be more proactive in helping national governments fight growing inequality in Europe, which I regard as one of the major social challenges currently facing the continent. Thirdly, I think we need to develop a credible migration policy. This, of course, is extremely difficult because it's a highly politicized issue, but we, we need a viable long-term migration strategy, and this, of course, means that we also need to rethink what kind of labor markets we want, etc. Fortress Europe is not the solution. Um, in order for walls to be effective, you need to have doors and windows as well. And this is something that we have not yet been able to design. <coughs> and f uh, fourthly, I would argue that we have to deal with aging populations, one of the issues that was mentioned earlier. Now, does all of this sound like a recipe for more Europe? Probably so, but not for ideological reasons. It's basically out of pragmatism and realism that I think we need to be able to um, expect more from the EU. <coughs> we need more ambitious tools and more ambitious policies to face these new uh, challenges. We probably need to reform our budget. It's absurd that a third of our budget is still dedicated to the common agricultural policy. Surely we can think of more interesting um, and dynamic and creative things to do with our money. Now, one problem, of course, with all of this is do all 27 member states um, share the same appetite for reform, for, for uh, proactive um, change within the EU? Possibly not. But let us uh, not forget that our motto, the EU's motto, is unity in diversity, and therefore we have to respect the fact that some member states may not be uh, in fully engaged in this kind of uh, activist uh, program. Brexit 
which I regard as a disaster for Britain and bad news for the EU, will nevertheless perhaps facilitate this. Um, and in fact, to some extent, the combination of Trump and Brexit, by the way, interestingly, has already <coughs> diminished Euroscepticism. We have seen an increase in the popularity of the European project uh, since Trump and the Brexit referendum. So finally, um, <coughs> I'm sure we'll have an opportunity in, in subsequent rounds to talk about more of those external issues that I mentioned initially. But my main concluding point would be if the EU still aspires to be a force for good in the world, as it necessarily must, it need, needs to be able to guarantee its political and economic and social cohesion first. Thank you. Thank you very much for that, uh, Charles. I'm going to swiftly move along now to Geoffrey von Orden for your opening remarks. Thank you very much. <clears throat> and may I also thank uh, ORF for uh, the kind invitation to come and take part in this uh, great, uh, great event. Um, I'm interested in uh, the mention of populism, by the way. Uh, someone wants to describe populism as popular ideas that you don't approve of. But uh, we, we, we want to talk about the future of the European Union. And it's in the context of disruptive transitions. And um, basically, I think the European Union's heading in the wrong direction. Uh, and that's a bit of a problem. Um, it had noble origins that we have to recognize. But uh, now it's heading in the direction of what I would regard as unsustainable political integration. Um, of course, uh, by the way, I should say that uh, the European Union is not Europe. Uh, there are significant European countries that are not members of the European Union. Uh, I think of Switzerland, I think of Norway, uh, I think of Turkey, and of course in a year's time, uh, the United Kingdom as well. So the European Union is not Europe. And in any case, um, there are at the moment 28 European countries that have strong bilateral relations with India, for example. And the trade delegations that you see coming to uh, India from uh, Belgium, from Germany, from the United Kingdom are a demonstration of that, those strong bilateral relationships. So there's no such thing as an EU economy. There are 28 <coughs> economies uh, in the European Union. Um, I mentioned the noble origins of the European Union. Of course, we all look back um, uh, with admiration on that. The idea, of course, was basically to stop Germany and France going to war uh, with one another, and then to improve the prosperity of the European people through um, uh, mobility of labor and uh, removal of barriers to trade. And I think that aim basically was achieved 30 years ago. And what a pity it didn't stop there while embracing, going on to embrace, the newly liberated countries of Eastern Europe. But unfortunately, the European Union became involved more and more in areas of policy uh, which were beyond its original remit. Um, and became what I would regard as an elite-driven project, ignoring the concerns of citizens. Uh, more and more areas of national sovereignty uh, have been eroded. And in some of the earlier discussions today, we, we talked about nationalism and we talked about sovereignty. And I wonder why people think that nationalism and sovereignty are good for India, but they're not good for our countries uh, in Europe. Um, Brexit has been a consequence of this erosion of sovereignty. Uh, and paradoxically, of course, Brexit also means that this drive to uh, political integration will be intensified, because it's regarded that the United Kingdom, of course, had something of a break on the ambitions to move in that direction. And now that that break is being removed, then we will see an accelerated uh, drive uh, in, in that way. It all assumes, of course, some sort of 
European demos as opposed to national a national uh, demos. Um, in fact, I would say that most people across Europe uh, view the European Union purely on a transactional basis. Yes, ease of movement, but also in financial terms. And bear in mind that of the 28 member states of the European Union, only nine of them are net contributors to the European Union budget. Uh, paramount amongst them, of course, is Germany, and second to Germany is the United Kingdom. So when the UK leaves, there is going to be a big hole in the EU budget. Um, and I think as we see countries moving from the status of net recipient to net contributor, then you'll find that their attitudes to the European Union evolve as well. Um, and there's another internal contradiction of the European Union, I think, and that is that as it pushes integration, it becomes less democratic. Uh, it becomes increasingly intolerant of dissent about its policies, <coughs> uh, about what I would call the EU orthodoxy. Uh, and in many countries, uh, we are seeing a growing Euroscepticism, not, by the way, uh, just the, the hooligan skinhead uh, element, which is the way many would like to characterize uh, those that are opposed to EU policies. Uh, in many ways, Denmark has long been quite exceptional uh, in the EU. Now we're seeing what are called the Visegrad countries are becoming uh, increasingly uh, disenchanted with the European Union. I'm talking there about the Czech Republic, I'm talking about Hungary, uh, Slovakia, and Poland. Uh, even in Germany, uh, you've seen 92 MPs elected uh, to the AFD party, uh, which is uh, really a Eurosceptic party, but also, of course, an anti-immigrant party. Immigration, of course, has been a main catalyst to Euroscepticism. Um, not, by the way, I would say, through any sense of racism, but a desire by our citizens to control their own borders. Uh, uh, a desire which I think you would have here in India and in most other Asian countries as well. Um, and I'm particularly concerned at efforts now to create uh, autonomous defense structures in the European Union, uh, duplicating NATO uh, and designed to give strategic autonomy, essentially that means from the United States, whereas I feel that the aim should be solidarity among the democracies, not creating separate structures of this nature. On the subject of Brexit, well, um, the British people decided to leave, and there are various motives about why they voted in the way that they did. Um, some would say it was purely sovereignty issues. It was concern about uh, uh, the, the mother of parliament having so many of its powers and its laws being made elsewhere now. Um, but for many people, I think control of our borders was the paramount issue. Um, I, by the way, voted remain, but purely for transactional basis. Like many of those that voted remain, uh, what certainly wasn't done out of, of any affection for the European Union or the way it is evolving. Uh, so I don't, see, uh, I don't see that the European Union is actually moving in the right direction there. However, the U United Kingdom uh, wants a very strong and close partnership with the European Union uh, in the future. Mr. And Van I Oden, think anything less we'll have uh, to would be uh, we'll extremely um, harmful, both for the United Kingdom and for the European Union. 
I'm afraid um, I'll have to leave your opening remarks there for now. We can you. continue the conversation. Well, in, in conclusion, I would say that uh, when... <laughs> three, three words. <laughs> when when uh, Brexit takes place, uh, the United Kingdom will again take on uh, its uh, global... Um, its global role and become, I think, a firm ally and partner of India. Thank you. Okay, thank you. We'll move swiftly along to Minister Magarovsky. Your, your initial comments, please. I'll try to be as frank as Geoffrey and a little bit more concise. Uh, please refrain your applause until afterwards. Can I ask, can we just have the opening comments and continue with the conversation? Thank you. Well, first of all, my heartfelt gratitude to the organizer of this event for inviting me. Thank you very much. I love agreeing with previous speakers, and this is what I'm going to do right now. I have to agree with Geoffrey when he says that uh, the European Union is not Europe. But I would like to make an addition to that. Very intriguing concept. When we talk about the history of Europe, we often mention uh, figures like uh, Adenauer, de Gaulle, Schumann, Monet, de Gasperi, I would add to that distinguished group also Chopin, Shakespeare, Beethoven, Max Planck. Uh, the roots and the origins of Europe as a political organism go much deeper than that. And we shouldn't forget about those very roots of Europe and not of the European Union. The European Union is a very useful tool which we can use to promote and to defend and to further our interests. Also in our immediate neighborhood. And uh, picking up on that, uh, I would like to say that uh, in my view, the neighborhood policy, all policies, is one of the most important, one of the crucial challenges the European Union and Europe are facing uh, nowadays. These policies have been neglected uh, over the last two or three decades. Uh, we have not been very successful in drawing, for example, our eastern neighbors closer to the European Union. The situation in the Mediterranean basis is quite messy. And I think that this requires a common effort to combat all those threats which are coming from different directions. <coughs> and uh, especially from our immediate neighborhood. Um, but this also requires unity. And we have not been united so far. And I will now tell you an anecdote. I know the audience usually hates anecdotes, but this one is going to be unfunny, so fortunately. I was interviewed uh, this morning by an Indian journalist who asked me, well, we, we touched up on many issues, but he asked me one specific question about uh, my country's relationship with uh, the European Union. He asked me, <coughs> what about your recent frictions with the European Union? And I just needed two milliseconds to find uh, a handy answer to that question. I said, we are the European Union. It's not a, a diplomatic spat between Poland and the European Union. We are the European Union. We, might, we may have different views, we may have different opinions, but we are part of the European Union. Uh, moreover, we have a very strong mandate to express our opinions quite clearly and quite openly, because more than 80% of the Polish population, according to, uh, to the recent surveys, are in favor of Poland not only remaining in the European Union, because there is no question of Paul exit right now in, in, in Polish politics, but also they are happy being members of the European Union, being citizens of the European Union. So it's not a conflict with the European Union, it's a conflict with one of the EU institutions. As many other conflicts, many other EU member states have or have had with other EU institutions. Uh, but that uh, leads me to another issue, which is uh, quite ticklish from Poland's perspective. Uh, one of the terms I absolutely despise when, when I hear 
uh, when I'm, I'm, I listen to, to many debates about the future of the European Union, one of those terms is Eastern Europe. And this term has sadly resurfaced recently, mostly in the debate about the immigration crisis. Uh, as long as we use this term, as long as many Western politicians still consider Eastern Europe as worse part of Europe, of the European Union, we won't be able to be speaking about united Europe. I'm afraid that the Iron Curtain, which physically does not exist any longer, still exists in our mentality, and mostly in the mentality of many Western politicians and political elites. This is what we, have, what we should fight quite vehemently, because this is one of the threats which still uh, hovers around the, about the future, over the future of the European Union. And uh, we need that unity, and we need to dismantle that, uh, that new Iron Curtain in order to deal efficiently with uh, all those problems, all those issues that the European Union is facing right now, and especially the neighborhood policies. Thank, Thank you. you very much for those remarks. I'm going to move on to Carl Bildt for your comments, please. Thank you. First, say it's great to be here, great with ORF, all is stimulating, good perspectives, and um, hopefully interesting debates also now. Start with agreeing with what you said. Um, but there is an Eastern Europe. No question about that. The geographical center of Europe is outside Vilnius in Lithuania, which is to the east of Poland. It is true that the present European Union is <coughs> Western and Central and Northern and Southern Europe, not really the South Eastern and not only and not the Eastern. Eastern Europe is there. That's Fyodor, that's Russia. You mentioned Shakespeare and the others. You could add Pushkin and Tchaikovsky. There's no question that Russia is also a European country, but not a member of the European Union, to put it very mildly. Um, a couple of remarks from my side, starting with saying something about the state of the European Union, the health of it. And I got two pictures to illustrate the health of the European Union. Um, these are the opinion polls that uh, are done across the European Union over the years. And they're quite interesting because they do show the, the state of the politics of Europe. What you see here is what are the concerns of people of the European Union? Which issues are dominating? And I would only highlight the fact that for a very long time it was sort of, it's the economy stupid as Clinton said. We went through very rough economic times, particularly after the 2008 financial crisis. <coughs> and the European Union was dominated by the one crisis meeting after the other. They all, all looked rather messy. None of them succeeded to sort out the crisis, but the combination of them evidently did. And you can see that concern with the state of the economy is going down very rapidly. That is a consequence of the European economy is going up. And as a matter of fact, during the last quarters, we are above the Americans in terms of economic growth rate, even if you take the population factor into account. But then the rise of other issues, the rise of terrorism, as has been alluded to previously here, and the migration crisis, particularly the 2015, which already been alluded to. I would say the migration crisis of 2015 was a traumatic experience for a number of countries, not because of the numbers. The Secretary mentioned 1.2 million. Sounds like a lot but it's 0.2% of the population. And it's roughly, by the way, the number of people that are moving to EU countries every year anyhow. But it was, as was alluded to also, it was the sense of loss of control that was there. And accordingly, the need to adjust policies, and that is ongoing, but you see that starting to, to change as well. But here you can see economic crisis was sorted out, agenda has shifted, but also a positive tendency. And if you look at the next picture, which is overall confidence in the European Union, you can see the last few periods have been a not insignificant increase in confidence in the European Union. Why, you might add, 
when you read in the newspapers about populism and things like that. Well, I, I alluded to what I call the BTP effect that we have had in virtually every country. And the BTP effect is a combination of Brexit, Putin, and Trump. Um, and the combination of that has led to a rise in support for the European Union between 5 and 10 percent in virtually every country where polling has taken place. Brexit has illustrated how really integrated our economies and society really are. I mean, we are more integrated than we were aware of. And, and, and accordingly, breaking loose is a very complicated process, as will be demonstrated. Uh, Putin, I leave Fyodor to sort out, but we are not entirely happy with the way Russian policies have been developing, to put it mildly. Uh, and Trump has, of course, challenged the liberal global and the rules-based global order, of which we are a part. And accordingly, this is the state of the European Union. Second remark from my side, just briefly, alluding to the previous debates here, and we've already been there, the concept of sovereignty, which the Americans are talking quite a lot about at the moment. I'm a European, and I have a different view of this. Um, sovereign states competing with each other without a rules-based order between them has been throughout European history. That's the lesson from the Peloponnesian Wars onwards, a recipe for war, disaster, and catastrophe. So the fact that we believe in sharing sovereignty is not a theoretical concept. It is a consequence of very horrible experience, not only during hundreds of years, but probably during thousands of years in our part of the world. As concerns sovereignty, I think the European concept is that you gain real sovereignty by sharing formal sovereignty. The Europe of dreams that was there before has perhaps faded somewhat. I agree with that, it has. But I would say the Europe of real practical need has surged in recent decades. I remember when I started some time ago to deal with these issues, it was in the treaties that we were supposed to have two summit meetings every year. That was supposed to be enough. Lisbon Treaty, we doubled that to four summit meetings every year. I think last year we had 12 summit meetings. That is not because heads of state and government are underemployed and want to go to Brussels and entertain themselves. That is not the reason. The reason is that our nations are too small. Even the biggest of nations, we are too small to manage the issues that are there. And you need to sit around that particular table and do these compromises, painful, messy, half-baked, but absolutely essential in order to manage the issues that we have, migration is only one of them. No one had thought that we needed to develop Carl, a common so asylum policy. I'm going to have to cut in over there, just you with should. time. Um, so Final issue. <laughs> she is merciless. I, I think we'll leave, we'll leave the issue yeah. and Fine. then come back to that, sorry. But um, Fyodor, your, your initial Thanks. brief comments, please. Thank you. Fyodor, over to you. <laughs> sort out Russia. <laughs> OK. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you for invitation. That's a great opportunity to be here and for the first time at the Rysina conference. Uh, and thank you, Carl, for reminding us that Russia belongs to Europe. I think it's a pretty important uh, uh, component of our mentality. Uh, so on behalf of uh, Pushkin, who was the biggest proponent of uh, European culture in Russia and who put Russia on the European cultural palette very, very high, but at, this, at, the, at the same time was, uh, by political views, a big nationalist and Russian uh, imperial thinking person. Uh, I would limit myself to three uh, short points uh, about the world, about European Union, and about Russia. Uh, as for the world, uh, I think the title of our panel is very illustrative, demonstrating the gap between reality which is coming and which is already with us, and our ability to assess it. Because uh, when, we, when I look uh, to, to the sentence, seeking leadership in the new world order, and I think all of us now assume that this new world order 
uh, will be the <coughs> multipolar one, completely different from what was expected, uh, say, 25, 30 years ago. My question is uh, what uh, the leadership has to do with the multipolarity. I think multipolarity is uh, what, however we understand this notion, is not about to lead some, somebody somewhere, but this is about to harmonize uh, diversity, to manage uh, different interests, uh, of course, on the rules-based uh, uh, basis, as, as Carl uh, rightly pointed out, but sharing sovereignty is only one among many ways to do it, and uh, what is uh, uh, um, uh, suitable for the European Union uh, is hardly imaginable in different parts of the world. So uh, leadership, seeking leadership in this world order, I don't think it should be an aim for anybody, including European Union, but not only them. So it's not about uh, be leader anymore, it's about something else. Secondly, uh, European Union, I think that uh, what uh, European Union is facing now is a huge challenge, which means to once again change the identity of this organization. Uh, as it was mentioned uh, by, uh, uh, by a Polish colleague, it was created initially to manage uh, terrible problems of Western Europe after the Second World War. And this project was unbelievably successful, maybe one of the most successful political projects uh, in uh, uh, mankind's history. After the Cold War, <coughs> uh, European Union obtained a different identity in the wake of, uh, in the wake of uh, uh, big uh, inspiration after end of uh, confrontation and collapse of the Soviet Union. European Union has started to be seen itself as a proto almost prototype for international system in the future, as a model for uh, others, and that, and, and uh, uh, to a certain extent, ever extending union, which would uh, bring this uh, uh, experience and values uh, far uh, uh, further away. Uh, I think now European Union is coming back to what it used to be before. Uh, 90, 1990s, a regional organization uh, which aim, uh, whose aim is to manage this region and to make it develop, prosper, uh, be secure, and so on. Uh, this is a very important uh, global role because uh, Europe as a region is exceptionally important for, the whole, for all of us and the whole, whole, the whole world, but it's not at all uh, to try to play the role at the global scale and to be, to be uh, an actor uh, among uh, those who try to define, so to say, uh, at the scale of the whole globe. Uh, and the uh, uh, European Union is, of course, uh, extremely important. Uh, I think that uh, in the world where more and more actors start to say that they are first, and this is not only United States, we, we hear those tunes everywhere uh, coming. Uh, the success of the European Union might be possible if Europe would be, will be able to say Europe first. Europe first, and all those who live in Europe will subscribe to that. So far, we see different trends inside the European Union, fragmentation as well. And uh, about Russia, Russia is facing another uh, very big challenge of uh, uh, historic proportion. Uh, this is how to rebalance itself towards the world, uh, which is not European and Western-centric anymore. Russian history since at least three centuries was about uh, how to behave and how to position itself vis-a-vis -vis Europe and uh, later on vis-a-vis -vis the West in, in general. Uh, that was a long uh, love and hate um, story, and the pendulum went uh, from one extreme to another, from hatred to, to attempt to laugh and back. And what is needed now in the world, which is not uh, European-centric anymore, and where Asia is playing, objectively playing, much bigger role, 
Russia should to change mentality, should change uh, its mentality, not against Europe, of course, uh, God forbid, but to understand that uh, uh, future future constellation will be different, and this is extremely extremely big task. We see it uh, being inside Russia how difficult it is to change uh, worldview, and a lot of concepts we still operate with are uh, outdated and uh, totally obsolete. But uh, I think that uh, it's uh, objective change which is inevitable. Thank you so much, Fyodor. And finally, of course, uh, Pedro, your comments, please. Thank you. Thank you very much. And again, many thanks also for, for being invited to this very important uh, um, uh, seminar and then to this uh, panel on the European Union. I think it's, it's fitting that I'm here. <laughs> um, and many thanks to previous speakers that I think have presented very well, actually, what the European Union is and, and where it's going. Going to the title and what our Russian colleague just, just mentioned, this is not about being first. This is about how can we build, and you will forgive me, maybe the naive expression, but a better world. And can the European Union contribute to this or not? And in our view, by its capacity, its size, uh, its impact on world affairs, it would be almost impossible for the European Union to say, no, I, I will not do it. We have to do it. We are, we are put in a position where we have a role to play, EU, European Union, member states of the European Union, within the European Union, in order to build this uh, world order. And because the new world order, whatever we want to describe it, it will be a world order which is based on interdependence. And it is based on cooperation. And cooperation is precisely at the heart of what the European Union is. It's at the heart of the project. So if there is one actor that has an experience in cooperation that can bring it uh, and, and, and an open project to what the world needs and towards the uh, direction the world needs to move on, we uh, think that the European Union certainly has things to bring. Uh, you were saying at the beginning, you know, what is the identity? How can we define? And I think Secretary West actually was, was very, very good in, 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 in concise in defining this. And I, I would define it with three words. And I would de define it with peace, cooperation, and values. I think this is at the heart of what the European Union is. And it's at the heart of what the European Union is internally. It's at the heart of what the European Union can project also externally. And I think our, our, our colleague from, from Poland also made a very important point. It's the cultural element that also true, and I have fully, full agreement with our member of the European Parliament, uh, the European Union is not Europe, uh, but the cultural, uh, uh, the European culture is a key unifying element that gives coherence to the European Union project. And I think that is also a very important element when we're defining the European Union. Um, um, Carl Bildt uh, went into very good statistics and, uh, and no, uh, polls actually and some statistics, uh, which I think define where we are and how the European Union is perceived. And if you ask the European citizens right now, well, most of them perceive that we're moving in the right direction and that they want to be part of, of this uh, project. I think that's important. And, and, and there we've seen the crisis, and we always refer to the crisis in, in the European Union. We're always tackling one crisis and another. I have a feeling sometimes that we're sort of a global psychotherapy session, uh, examining crisis and how guilty have we been in causing this crisis or not and how can we overcome it. But when we look at the crisis we've had, and, and one of the most acute ones was the, uh, the financial crisis, it has been overcome. Now we are, and, and you, you mentioned this, we have a period of five years uninterrupted growth. We es estimate that we have uh, sustainable growth for the years to come at, 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 at uh, uh, levels that are amongst the highest for highly developed economies. And that is something I think that cannot be uh, neglected. And yes, security is among the main concerns of, of European citizens right now. And in, in handling this, what is the situation? Yes, we have a very complex, is it a problem of the European Union itself? or? It is a problem of the uh, it is a problem of the European Union because we have to help provide answers, no doubt. But yes, we are confronted with challenges, and we are confronted with challenges to the east, and uh, and we are confronted uh, with challenges in the Middle East. We are confronted with challenges to, to the south, and some of them have translated in in different phenomena. Migration has been one of this, and and yes, the number of. Uh, refugees or migrants, flows of persons entering into the EU in 2015 
were tremendous and very difficult to cope with. I can't imagine not uh, any member state, which had tremendous difficulties in coping, but any state that would have been confronted with that flows of refugees would have faced tremendous challenges. We have, we are still uh, handling uh, uh, this issue, but we have acted united in the European Union with a lot, and everything we do, of course, in the European Union is on the open. So, of course, it's, uh, and, and all the disagreements are in the open and discussed in the press, which may be a strength, but certainly uh, uh, emphasizes the, the criticism. But we have put many mechanisms in place, both regarding internal solidarity, both regarding, also regarding um, the management of borders, the sharing of information, but what's more important, cooperation with international partners. And here again I go to the cooperation element. Cooperation with international partners to see how we manage this. And we see recent developments also in how the European Union is working with the United Nations, with the African Union, to handle terrible situations of migrants in, in Libya. Um, and we have been very much at the forefront in trying to find solutions, and we're uh, very happy that we're working now very actively and well with the African Union and the United Nations. These are not easy problems. These are problems um, that have structural um, uh, uh, causes that are also linked to, um, to conflicts, and obviously they don't have easy nor quick solutions, not for any state acting on its own, certainly not any state acting on its own, and not easy solutions for the European Union, which, by the way, never acts on its own internationally, but acts with partners. But we are facing this, and we're giving solutions. And in reality, the numbers have gone dramatically down, and the situation now is very different from the one that we had in, in 2015. I'm going to have to ask you to leave it there, I'm afraid. Um, I would like to also allow for questions and things. So let's just have a, just a brief discussion. And I wanted to pick up on, on some of the comments that you've um, made. Marek, I'd like to just start with you. and and your comments on, on the EU and, and the EU being a useful tool but not being united at the moment. I wanted to ask you what you think the EU should be doing uh, with regards to a rise in nationalism and, and populism. How should it strive towards forming a united identity at the moment given that there are conflicting views? Well, we, uh, first of all, we can't create a parallel <coughs> democracy. Uh, all those governments which have been elected re recently have been elected democratically. I mean. Uh, for example, the coalition government in Austria, there was a lot of buzz about that particular coalition, but it was the, the Austrian voters who made a decision. Marine Le Pen got, uh, made it to the second round of the French presidential election because of the voters' will. I'm, I'm myself personally a bit, a bit concerned about that because Marine Le Pen has always been very vocal, uh, talking about, for example, France's uh, membership in NATO, which, uh, <laughs> Again, as in, in the case of Great Britain, uh, we would uh, deeply regret France if France decided to leave NATO in a foreseeable future. I hope it will never materialize. But anyway, this is what the, the, the voters, in, mostly in Western countries, decide. And uh, this is a democratic process. We can't forget that. We, we cannot you know, <coughs> feel offended by the fact that many voters decided the way we dislike because this is what democracy is about. Sometimes we dislike the decisions made by, by voters. So uh, as long as this rise in uh, populism, I, I, I can't see any, any particular, any specific threat coming from, from the fact that uh, these democratic processes do work. Um, of course, we have to, uh, sometimes, you know, when, uh, when there is a coalition government like in Austria, uh, the right-wing parties which enter governments sometimes change the tack a little bit. They sometimes shift their priorities. And they do realize, for example, that it doesn't make much sense to criticize the European Union just for the sake of criticizing it. So I believe that uh, in many of those cases, uh, we shouldn't be too worried about what is going on in Austria and France and maybe also in Germany. <laughs> uh, the question is whether the European Union has not contributed itself to these phenomena, trying to lecture, for example, some countries for some policies carried out in those countries, some domestic issues. Because if you uh, are too adamant and too determined to interfere in, some, in the internal affairs of some member countries, that also 
stokes populism and stokes nationalism. That's a, a quite a natural phenomenon. So I think that uh, this works uh, both sides. I mean, the European Union and the European institutions, mostly, uh, have to think twice sometimes. Uh, and I'm, I'm referring mostly to some, some politicians who, who have also been very vocal in criticizing uh, national governments and national parliaments for some decisions taken over the last couple of years. Sometimes you need some, you know, you have to um, refrain from some commentaries which would be considered as uh, insulting, offensive, especially when you represent the European Union and the European EU institutions. Carl, I'd like you to just to pick up um, off the back of uh, Mark's comments. I mean, he's speaking about the fact of you know democracy and 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 the fact these were elected um, by the people. But how then should the EU be balancing between the idea of the concerns over growing security threats and at the same time also holding on to values that allow for integration um, and also tolerance of, for example, immigrants? Well, we are we are dependent upon immigrants, to be quite frank, when it comes to our economies, and, and we want to be sort of somewhat more diverse society. I belong to those that consider somewhat more diverse society to be more creative societies. So I, I, I would certainly not like to have a Europe that is a fortress against the outside world, saying no one is welcome. But of course, it is a process that needs to be managed. And what is happening, going back to my graphs and going back to sort of those that have been elected in different countries, is that we are a combination of democracies. We have elections all the time somewhere. And uh, you see how the political systems evolve, and you see how the issues and concerns that are materialized in those elections translate into efforts also on the European level. The fact that the European heads of state and governments are now dealing with migration policy and border management and those things in addition to digital issues is a reflection of both of concerns and the need for the world out there. But as concerns, and, and if you look at these populist parties that are discussed at the moment, nowhere particularly large. And we should not forget that looking back at the history of the politics of Europe, We've had waves that have been more destabilizing. Uh, go back to the late 40s and early 50s, communist parties were very large and were on the verge of taking over large countries. Have you heard about a communist party in Western Europe lately? No, you haven't. Uh, we had a wave of green parties entering parliaments in different countries, be that 10, 15 years ago or something like that. We now have a wave of parties more to the right that are more nationalist than anti-immigration. I think they're beginning to fade if we get that situation under control. But it's, I would say, you can see it as a testimony to the uh, vibrancy of the combined democratic political system. It's never going to be stable. It can't be stable because the world changes and the concern of the electorate changes. Okay, and, and speaking of, of change, um, Jeffrey, I, I can't but not ask you about Brexit. I know you touched on it uh, briefly. Um, but, you know, there's a lot of discussion about the future of, or kind of the future relationship between Britain and the EU. I actually want to ask you about the future relationship of Britain and the rest of the world. What kind of position should the UK be negotiating? Do people in the rest of the world still actually care what... A, an old power actually has to say, and, and what kind of position should, the, uh, should Britain be looking at going forward? Well, um, there's been a lot of talk in Britain about uh, remaining in the single market, for example, and the reason, of course, we can't remain in the single market is we want control of our own borders. There's been talk in Britain about remaining within the customs oh, yeah. union. The reason we can't remain in the customs union is because we would not then be able uh, to negotiate trade agreements with other countries, and that's something that we want to be uh, free to do. I mean, Britain has always been uh, a global nation, an outward-looking nation. I hope Britain will become a bastion of free trade, and I hope it will uh, re-energize its relationships with many countries, which I think have been neglected over many decades. 
and foremost among those uh, is India, but there are many other countries as well. <coughs> so I'm optimistic about Britain's position in the world. Um, at the moment, I'm not so optimistic uh, about um, how we're going to conclude these negotiations with the European Union, because the EU is very inflexible, and that's a characteristic, I'm afraid, of the European Union, uh, which is one of the reasons which led to Brexit. Thank you. Well, on, on flexibility, I just want to pivot slightly and ask you, Fyodor, with regards to Russia, to what extent should the EU be rethinking its relations and the way it interacts with Russia, given the changing world order? Uh, it's not too much to rethink just now because it was a model which uh, was adopted after the end of the Cold War and uh, which at that time was shared by both sides that Russia should uh, become affiliated with bigger, greater Europe, be part of it, not member of the European Union, but part of some um, Brussels-centric sphere, uh, which didn't work. And since uh, it became clear that it didn't work, uh, we don't have any idea about our uh, model of our relationship in the future. So it's not about rethinking, it's about thinking. <laughs> Charles, I'd like you to pick up on, on the back of Fyodor's comments. Um, you, you painted quite a, a bright picture with no, regards mean, to the EU, and um, I'd just like to know your thoughts with regards to the EU and, uh, and Russia. Well, constructive, we've been talking talking the talk for many years, constructive engagement with Russia. Um, the European Global Strategy recently adopted doesn't really tell us um, what that should consist of, to be honest. Um, but the point I'd really like to make is that I don't see Russia as a power which really has an alternative model, in, a, a rival model to our liberal international order. Um, basically, Russia objects to U.S. supremacy within that liberal international order. And I think we have to find ways in which to continue to work with Russia on key global issues, climate change, the Middle East, um, Iran, nuclear disarmament, and so on, this, these kinds of issues. Um, the, the real question, though, perhaps is what should our attitude be towards Russia in our neighborhood? Should we effectively allow Russia a permanent veto um, as to what happens in Ukraine, Georgia, Moldova? Uh, what happens if the majority of the population of those countries um, were in a position to advocate, as in fact some, some have tried in the past, um, EU membership at some future date? Should we continue to regard these countries as part of a Russian sphere of influence? Uh, and let me say, by the way, I've been quite shocked about a lot of the things I've been hearing today about national sovereignty, and I, I'd like to pick up on Carl Bildt's um, point there. You know, we, this morning we heard that nationalism is the only answer to terrorism, um, and that basically the future lies with the nation state. You know, well, hello, that's 19th century stuff, yeah. you know? <laughs> On, on that point, I'm told we're running uh, quite short of time. I had promised questions, and uh, I will have to give those two questions to Rysina Young Fellows. Uh, so may I ask uh, Reshma Kaskina, if you're here, I, are you able to come forward and, and ask a question? Thank you. Does it work? Yes. So my name is Rasma Kaskina, and I come from Latvia. Uh, it is a very small member state in the EU, and uh, I truly believe that uh, if Latvia would not be in the EU, uh, then, well, its voice within the European continent or also globally, it would be quite difficult to be heard. And I thought it was somewhat telling that, uh, well, the topic of, the, of this panel was about the EU in the new world order, but uh, mostly what was spoken of where uh, EU's internal problems and issues, some speakers uh, showed it in a more positive light, some in a more negative. But uh, if we look at really, let's say, to the world order as such, um, 
Let's take, for example, two. Ma two sorry, issues. may I just ask you a question? If you could just ask you a question, because we are yes. short on time. Sure. Uh, so, just two elements. So, uh, EU is the biggest donor of uh, world in the world of the development aid, and also there's a uh, pursuing a very active trade policy. So, is it not a thing that it's mainly the problem is somewhat also of the perception of the EU and that it's the focus of too many negative parts? Okay, thank you. And just the second question is from Michael Singh, if you could ask. Hello, uh, I'm Michael Singh, I'm a German lawyer. Um, I have a twofold question to Mr. Bolt um, with regard to the actual proposals for an EU 2.0. Um, what is the likelihood of a Europe of two speeds, um, as was just recently proposed again by Macron, and whether this would be a viable uh, route for an invigoration of the European, Euro, uh, European Union within the EU with regards to Euro, Euro skepticism and externally in this new world order. Thank you. Okay, thanks. Uh, Pedro, I can see you've been scribbling quite uh, furiously. Would you like to, any comments? Well, on, <coughs> thank you. On the, um, uh, on the perception of the EU as, as an international actor, uh, no doubt. I mean, I, 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 I'm not sure what the perception, I have a perception, but maybe it's, um, it's, um, uh, it's a Brussels perception, but the perception is that we are a very powerful and important global actor, not only on trade, on development, on humanitarian action, but also diplomatically pursuing um, a, a rules-based uh, international order, supporting main initiatives, climate change, non-proliferation, disarmament, uh, values policy, human rights, engaging in crisis, crisis management structures that the European Union has, its capacity to deploy operations in support of the United Nations in cooperation with other partners is quite unparalleled in the international community. So I think that, that should, we should stop asking a question about that. I think it is a, it's a, it's, it's a reality, and, and I think we have to acknowledge uh, that. Uh, on the different speeds in Europe, we have, Europe is a, is a, it has and is a, a common project of all its member states, and it's important that it remains so. It has different already uh, tracks that are working with different uh, geometries, and then it's the Eurozone, and you have Schengen, and, and even now we have created now permanent structured cooperation and defense, which, by the way, almost uh, all member states are participating. So that's a way of advancing, but, but it's a way of advancing that has to bring all member states and all the European Union uh, uh, together. Okay, and, and uh, on that, Mark, I know you indicated... Yes, just like briefly on the issue of the multiple-speed Europe. Um, I believe it's, a, it's an empty slogan. I, I'll give you a, a very telling example, two to be precise. Um, about 65% of jobs created last year in the European Union were created in Poland. And uh, more than 60% of economic migrants who arrived in the European Union were absorbed by Poland, mostly from Ukraine, of course. So now tell me if Poland is in the first speed Europe or in the second speed Europe. And on that note, I'm afraid we're going to have to leave it. Samir has indicated we're way out of time. We'll have to take the conversation offline. But thank you all for your thank time you. and thank you to our wonderful Thank panelists. you, Serena, for what we